I'm going to introduce myself and welcome you. My name is Jennifer Stem, and I am a secondary peer consultant. And Erin over here in the black jacket is also a secondary peer consultant. And so we're going to walk you through the observation cycle this morning. But if you look over here for just a minute, what we're going to do today is that mentors will conduct focused observations of mentee and utilize the data collection tool and other handbook resources. And then Katie's passing around a blue piece of paper. And at the top it says observation cycle and we've printed our objective right underneath there. And then underneath that are two boxes that are labeled rating one and rating two. In box rating one, would you give yourself a rating from one to five at how comfortable you feel with our objective for today? Just right now, how comfortable do you feel? A one being, I don't even know where to start with observations, what are you talking about? To a five being, oh, I can observe, I can collect data, I've got this all down. Okay, so if you have your rating in the rating one box, if you would turn to your shoulder partner or somebody at your table, you don't have to share your rating, but maybe you just want to share your thoughts at this point of how you're feeling about, oh, I have to observe somebody, what? Okay, so take a minute and talk to the people at your table. So the first thing we want to look at is why do we observe? What's the purpose of doing observations? Well, first, we want to provide validation. We want to help build our mentees' confidence in their practice. When we're observing, we want to look for evidence of things that we've discussed in our conferences, and that way we can help recognize and validate their feelings, their actions, and the progress that they're making. Everybody loves to feel validated. Another reason we want to observe is to provide them feedback. Through that feedback, we can offer questions and specific things that can help them grow in their practice. And then finally, it's also a requirement for the licensure now. It's going to be critically important for you to follow through with the observations and follow through with the conferences um, in order for them to be able to apply for their professional license at the end of the year. If you were here at the 8 o'clock start, then you heard a little bit about some of those logistics. You need to have three observations. They can be virtual or in person. And then you'll also need to have um, feedback and engage the mentee in conversation. And then we have another handout for you that's going to go in your conferences and observations tab. So if you'd find in your notebook the conferences and observations tab. All right, so this is the observation cycle. There are four steps. The first step is the pre-observation conference, and I'm going to walk you through how to do that. And then the second step is the observation with data collection. Step three is post-observation conversation planning, and step four is the post-observation conversation. At our next training, we will go more in depth in step three and four. Today, you'll just get a preview of what those steps are, and then we'll talk about them more in detail at our next training. Okay, so when you're observing, obviously you need to be aware of what's going on in the classroom, right? You need to be able to see and hear and know what things are going on. So you need to be very aware. So we have a little test for you. We're going to test your awareness here in just a second. Some of you might have already seen it before, and if you had, don't spill the beans. Just let people enjoy it. And so Aaron's pulling it up, and here's our awareness test. This is an awareness test. How many passes does the team in white make? Go! The answer is 13. But did you see the moonwalking bear? Sometimes we go into a classroom and we're thinking, I need to be counting how many passes are being um, done by the kids in the white shirts. And the teacher or the person that we're observing is thinking that we're going to be looking for the moonwalking bear. And so the data we collect, the information, the conversation just doesn't quite go right because we didn't have a shared focus. 
So that is one of the more important things that we need to do when we're observing is to have a shared focus. Well, how do you do that? You're going to do that in step one of the pre-observation conversation. If you look in that same tab that you're in, conferences and observations, and find page 17, page 17 has some good information on how to conduct this pre-observation conversation. It's not necessarily a script, but it gives you some ideas of how you might lead that conversation and some things you want to include. So for the shared focus, you want to have a shared focus. You want to agree upon what it is that you're going to be observing for and what kind of data you're going to leave for that person. Usually, through the if conversation, you, um, you can come up with what that shared focus is. But if your mentee is struggling a little bit, doesn't really know kind of what they want to have collected, feel free to offer them some suggestions of data that you can collect for them. And if they're still kind of like, mm, not real sure, then go back to whatever their individual goals are. And sometimes that can help lead you into a conversation about what do you want me to look for and what kind of data would you like me to collect. Um, but you just want to make sure you agree before you kind of end this conversation that you both agree on what it is that you're looking for and what kind of data you will be getting for them. Previewing the lesson plan is also a great way to try to figure out what the shared focus is. Um, this gives you a chance to ask questions, to help the mentee maybe with a more focused plan. And this is a great opening for offering them suggestions of things that um, perhaps using your mentor language and sliding in those suggestions in there um, to help them with their lesson planning. And then ground rules. Ground rules are real important to establish with your mentee. When are you going to observe? How long are you going to observe? Sometimes these logistics can be um, a little strange and a little wonky from time to time. You may need to find an administrator or an MTSS coach or a colleague or somebody who can help cover your responsibilities while you go observe your mentee. Um, if you really struggle with that, maybe you find an administrator and say, hey, you know, I need to go observe this person for their license and I'm having trouble finding somebody and maybe they can help problem solve that with you. It's real important, especially the first time, to be as flexible as possible to choose a time when your mentee will be comfortable for that first observation. And then also when you're talking about these kinds of ground rules, that's a great time to set a time for your post-observation conversation. You know, our schedules get really busy and you don't want to make an observation and then be all of a sudden, oh, well, we got to get together after that and then have that conversation two weeks out. You'll forget what they were doing and they'll forget what they were doing and then it won't be as effective. And then the next thing you want to really look at during your pre-observation conversation is the logistics. Where are you going to sit in the room? You need to be able to see everything, be able to hear everything. You do not probably want to interact with students unless that's something that you and your mentee have agreed upon together that maybe they want you to do something with the students. But normally, don't necessarily interact with them. You want to have an agreed upon spot for where you're going to leave the feedback, someplace that the person can get to pretty easily, but yet also ensures the confidentiality of that feedback that you're leaving. And then um, you also want to try to establish the norm that the mentee needs to go back and read the feedback, look over those reflective questions, and have processed some of that even before your post-observation conference. They need to look at that, maybe if they had questions or something, to begin processing that before you guys meet again. So Jennifer walked you through step one of this four-step observation cycle. We are now going to focus on step two, the data collection. But first, I want to point out one additional resource to you. This is in your handbook, same tab that you're in, observation and conferences. And it's on page 18. And you might want to flag it. This is a great just overview of observations. And this is something that would be great to review with your mentee. Because you may think, okay, I'm going in to observe my mentee, so I'm the only one that really has responsibilities with that. That's not really true. Your mentee has some responsibilities with that too. So this would be good to review with him or her prior to your first observation so that you can both kind of get an idea of what's expected for each of you in that role. So you might flag that to review. Okay, so when you get to 
the actual observation. This is step two, right? You're going to gather some data. You are going to use a data collection tool. And this is in a couple of different places. There's a sample of it in conferencing and observing, and that's on page 22. And then there's also a blank copy behind your tools tab. And this is something that you can make copies of. We do have this electronically, so I'll make sure that Amy includes that in the email that she sends out with that conversation log that Amanda was showing you this morning. And you can see there's nothing special about this. There's just two columns, what you're seeing from the teacher and what you're seeing from the students, right? This is also known sometimes as selective scripting. And I want to like highlight selective. There is no way in an observation that you can go in and write down absolutely everything that the teacher is doing and absolutely everything that the student is doing, right? You need to be selective in the data that you're gathering. So what the most important thing is, is that you're gathering data on that shared focus that you and the teacher determined together in step one in your pre-observation conversation. So again, like Jennifer pointed out, that you're not going in watching for how many passes are made and the teacher thinks you're walking, watching for the moonwalking bear, right? You need to have that shared focus in your mind and only gather data on that shared focus, okay? So um, go ahead and you'll use this tool for when you're doing those observations and keep in mind that less is more. So we're going to do a little practice observation. And this is a video of a new teacher. Her name is Janet and Felice, and she teaches in Frederick Douglass Academy in New York. It's a K-8 building. She teaches sixth grade math is the lesson we're going to see. And she and her mentor have already met. They've already had their pre-observation conversation, and they determined a shared focus. That shared focus is, Janet said, can you please watch for my level of questioning? I want to see if I'm ever getting into higher levels of questioning. And then can you also look for with my students how much they're using the math vocabulary that we've been working on. And right now you're just going to watch about a three minute clip. You're going to do no note taking at all. So please don't write anything in the data collection tool that you have flipped to in your handbook. You are just watching no note taking. Good afternoon boys and girls. Good afternoon. Okay, so today how can students use the Pythagorean theorem to find the length of a hypotenuse? That's what we're learning today. Bintu, can you come and give a paper? You guys are going to start with your do now. I'm going to put a time on the board. I also have the do now on the other side for the students on that side of the room can see. When you get your paper, get started. Okay? It is 125. You have until 1. 32 to solve the six problems. If anybody has any questions or needs help, raise your hand and I'll come over. So you would multiply 5 by... Excellent. So what does the small number, the exponent, tell the big number to do? Good. So let's change this to multiply. Two things divided by something to equal four. Two, two number, the two of the same numbers multiplied, right? By each other to equal four. <coughs> Good. Okay. Excellent. Two times two. Excellent. You got it. Good job. How do you find the square root of four? Okay, so take a look at the number you have, and when we learn square root, we learn that we have to find a number that you multiply times itself, and then would equal four. So think of your times table. What do you know? Excellent, you got it. And you follow the same steps for the next two, okay? You're welcome. Where's your square root for the, oh, it's down here? Okay, great, good job. Okay, boys and girls, what we're going to do is you're going to have a turn to come up and put your answers on the board. Okay, so just a three-minute clip. Obviously, you'll observe your mentee longer than three minutes, right? This is just a sample, just a practice. Jennifer is handing around a data collection tool, and it has data on it that Janet's mentor could have written down based on that three-minute observation. 
So I want to give you just a minute to just silently to yourself look over the data that was collected. This is your copy, so feel free to write on this, highlight if you want to, whatever, but look at the data that Janet's mentor collected just for a minute, and then you're going to get a chance to process this with your partners. Okay, so I'm going to set the timer for about three minutes to give you time to process with your elbow partner or a trio to talk about what did you see, what questions do you have, what, what's there, what are you thinking with all of this. So your conversation is focused around the data that was provided by the mentor. You might notice that the mentor's data was very evidence-based was very evidence-based. So when you're collecting data for your mentee, you want that evidence-based. Again, and I, it, I keep saying this because it's so important, you want the data to be based on that shared focus, 100%. You want it to be evidence-based, specific, and non-judgmental. And I don't know about you, but when I think of non-judgmental, I think of negative things, but non-judgmental can also be positive things, that you're making a positive comment, but it's putting your own opinion or your own judgment into that data, right? You don't want that. And you want to try to balance warm feedback, which is positives, with cool feedback opportunities for growth. So if the evidence is maybe not very positive, the evidence that you're gathering, you might want to try to look for a couple of things that you can put in that are positive, even if they're not exactly based on the shared focus. Like if the shared focus is level of questioning and it's not going so well, you could always throw in a comment in there about, um, you know, referenced voice levels or referenced champs or achieve or something like that to give a little bit of warm feedback in there as well. So we have just a couple of examples here and they, they match up together. So the left side is evidence-based, the right side is lacking evidence. So you might say when the bell rang at 942, six students were out of their seats. Lacking evidence, students out of seats. It doesn't give specific data, it doesn't give specific time. So it's lacking that evidence. Seven students raised their hands to answer the question, or not very many students raised their hands. After giving your attention signal, all students were at level zero voices in four seconds, as opposed to saying your attention signal works. So uh, your attention signal works, that's positive, but it doesn't give that specific data. So you really want it to be data-driven, very specific, and let the teacher make his or her own judgments. If only seven kids out of the 20 in the classroom raised their hands, maybe last time only two raised their hands. So seven is an improvement, right? But you coming in for this snapshot, maybe you didn't know that. So you want to you allow the teacher to analyze the data, him or herself, and you just provide that data. You just provide that third point to them. It's not my opinion. It's not your opinion. It's just the facts, okay? Any questions about evidence-based data? I think you definitely saw that with the data that this mentor collected on that data collection sheet. So now you're going to get to watch a continuation of this video clip. You're going to get to watch the next three minutes of Janet's lesson, okay? Same shared focus, and this time you're the mentor, okay? So on that sample that Jennifer handed out, if you flip it over, it's blank on the back so that you can continue writing on it. Just a reminder, our shared focus is the teacher's level of questioning and the student's use of math vocabulary. So take whatever notes you want to during that three minutes. Okay, we're only gonna watch this three minute clip once, so you're gonna have to kind of watch and collect data and write at the same time. Questions before you start? Your shared focus is teacher level of questioning and student use of math vocabulary. Who would like to do number one? Christopher, come on up and do number one. Sign up. And then just be prepared to explain what you did. What were you trying to solve? Five to the second power equals five total five equals to twenty-five. Excellent. How did you know to multiply five times five? Because the coefficient, the 5, right? And the 2 is the, is, is the coef, is the exponent. So the exponent tells you to add the, the, the 5 by itself. So I did 5 times 5 equals to 25. Excellent. Good job. Thank you. 
seven to the second power is seven times seven equals 49. Thank you, good job. Read us the problem. What do you have? 10 to the second power. 10 times 10 equals 100. Good job, excellent. Okay, Harlan, can you read us the problem and tell us what you did? Um, the number I had was 81. So, like I know that nine times nine equals 81. My answer was nine. Excellent, good job. The 12 times 12 equals 144 with the 144 of the product. These two equals 100 is the um, square root because when it's because if it's not if you could divide it into two numbers the same two numbers this must be the square root and I know that 12 times 12 is 144 so 12 must be the square root. Any questions about squaring the numbers or square roots? Yes. Are there any other signs for a square root? Right now, this is the main sign we use for square root. Boys and girls, does anybody see anything similar about squaring numbers and finding square roots? Is there anything similar about those two processes? Raekwon. To square, you have to multiply the same number. To, to find out the square root, you have to, you have to um, divide that number by whatever number can multiply itself to get the other number, to yeah. get the product. It is similar because you do have to multiply a number by itself, but who could add to that? Adamola. All the numbers in the question has a squ could be squared or has a square root. Yes, all our problems have, can be squared or have a square root, but there's something similar about those two operations. Okay, so now we're going to do a pair, compare, share. So you're going to pair with your elbow partner again, and you're going to share the data that you collected, kind of compare your data to your shoulder partner's data, and then just have a conversation about some of the difficulties of this. I heard somebody say, you can't look up. Like, I can't observe because I'm taking notes the whole time. It's a balancing act that you definitely get more skilled at the more you do it, for sure. It's tricky, there's no doubt. So have a conversation about the actual data you collected and then about the process itself of observing and collecting data around that shared focus. Something that I heard at several tables that is worth mentioning is that occasionally you are going to see something to which you want to draw the teacher's attention that's not part of the shared focus, right? Either a positive, which is great, or it could be a, a room, a, growth opportunity. One thing that kept sticking out, and I've seen this video a couple of times, but one thing that kept sticking out is she, this teacher, Janet, she was great at positive interactions, but her positive interactions were almost always the exact same thing. Great job. Great job. Thank you. Great job. So, and that's not it. I mean, she has positives. I mean, to me, that's a thing to celebrate. You might want to help her come up with some different positives that she could use so that she's not always using the same ones. And granted, maybe being in front of a camera made her kind of focus on that one and, you know, nerves, all of that. But can you make note to yourself of, hmm, this might be something that we want to talk about in the future? Absolutely. Just try to keep the data that you collect for the teacher based on that shared focus as much as possible, okay? Unless it's a safety issue, then you want to bring it up, even if it's not part of the shared focus, okay? And you will get time here in just a minute to kind of troubleshoot some things with observations, so if you're still having grappling with some things, you'll get some time to process that. Okay, so this is just bringing your attention back to the observation cycle. Jennifer walked you through step one. I've walked you through step two, which is just the actual observation and data collection, okay? And Jennifer also foreshadowed that steps three and four will come in the next mentor training. But you're going to need to do an observation probably before the next mentor training. So I just want to briefly highlight steps three and four for you, okay? And you have this graphic again in your handbook so you can refer back to it. Step three is a personal planning on the mentor's part. It comes after you've observed and gathered the data, but before you talk to your teacher about that observation. And this is where you as the mentor just take a minute to review the data that you've gathered and try to kind of plan what feedback you're going to give, what questions might you ask in your conversation with the mentee, okay? 
This is a step that is easy to skip. When you're busy, which we all are, in time crunches, it is easy to skip this step. But let me tell you, this step is so important. Even if it happens for two minutes outside the teacher's room in the hallway, like just take a minute to gather your thoughts, review the data, and think through, in what way am I going to focus this conversation? How am I going to drive this? What questions am I going to ask? It's an important step. It doesn't have to be a lengthy step. Okay, step four is that actual post-observation conversation. So you've had the observation, you've thought about what you're gonna say, now you're actually talking to the teacher again. So you allow first the mentee to reflect on the observation. So tell me how you think that observation went. You just give them time to talk. You collaboratively review the data together. Again, remember I said you let the teacher make his or her own analysis of that data. So you just look at it together. This is helpful if, um, if your handwriting maybe isn't very clear or you've made some notes that the teacher's like, I'm not sure what this one means. It's, this is why you do this collaboratively, so you can help explain the data that you collected. You might analyze student products. If this teacher's focus was something about, um, you know, I wanna know if the kids mastered my objective, you might actually look at some student work together based on that observation. And then you determine and document your next steps. So now we've done this observation, we've collected this data, now what? And just as Amanda pointed out earlier with that uh, conversation log, you could use that conversation log at this time to write down what went well in that observation, what were some of the concerns or challenges, what are the teacher's next steps, and in what way will you support the teacher in his or her next steps. Okay. So Jennifer is going to, in just a second, walk us through kind of wrapping up our learning. Just remember with observations, balance that warm and cool feedback. Okay. And in thinking through some reflective questions that you'll ask the teacher, there are a few pages behind observations and conferences tab in your handbook that you might want to just fold down the corner or flag in some way. Page 8 and pages 14 through 16 have some sample reflective questions, some questioning stems that might help you as you are done observing and you're planning for that post-observation conversation. Okay, well, we're going to take a few minutes to kind of reflect on what we've learned. It's been a lot doing the pre-observation conference and then all the stuff there is to remember with the data collection and observing and mentors will conduct focus observations of mentee and utilize data collection tool and other handbook resources. So underneath that where it says rating two, I want you to use the same rating scale, one being, ah, I don't know where to start with observations, I don't know anything about them, to five being, uh, very confident in knowing that you can do the observation and use the data collection tool and you've got this under your belt. So take a minute to think about it. Where do you stand at this point with that objective? There are a couple other things I want us to do before we're dismissed from this section and that is looking at next steps. So if you look underneath where you wrote your ratings, there's a little road sign that says goal ahead. In that section, it says, it's my goal to complete my first observation by blank. Kind of think through the next few weeks and try to write down a date or a general idea. Maybe you want by the end of October or before the next mentor training. But go ahead and actually write something down. It's better to have a goal and shoot for something. Okay, then underneath that, it says something about, you know, things you want to keep in mind for that first observation. And let me give you a couple of things that we just kind of want to summarize with you, is that during your first observation, you want to try to be as positive and maybe a little more casual than you will at another one, but try to make that one as positive as possible. Remember, Aaron was talking about the warm and cool feedback. So for each reflective question, maybe try to leave three positives in your data or in your summary or with your conversation. You're gonna wanna really try to walk that fine line between keeping that relationship of trust that you've been building with them and by giving them some feedback. And then there's a giant blank space at the bottom of the page. We want you to take this blue page back to your schools with you 
back to your offices, and as you're going through these steps, when you have your pre-observation conference, or when you do your observation, or you meet with them afterwards, as you come across questions, challenges, um, concerns that you might have, maybe you would just, is this normal? Does this happen to everybody? We've given you some space where you can write those things down in one place, and then bring that blue sheet back to the next training when we'll talk about the next steps in the observation cycle. Okay, so that just kind of gives you some note taking. You're more than welcome to use it. You don't have to, but we wanted to provide you a place to kind of jot down those questions that you may not have today because you haven't done it yet, but will come up in the future. If you and your mentee agree that the first time you observe, it's just to get a sense of your mentee's teaching style, just kind of watch how things are going so far, and you don't want to collect any data, that's definitely an option that you can follow. However, your time is limited, and so to, to go in and observe and not collect any data may not be the best idea for you. It may not work with your schedule, that kind of thing. So you need to determine for yourself and for your mentee in what ways are you going to make that happen? How does that work best with your schedule? Do you need to make sure that you're collecting data every single time you go in because your time's limited? Or do you have a little time that you could pop in for a five, 10 minute quick observation and just leave a couple of positives but not collect any data? So you can still leave some feedback without it being very data driven.